Good evening and welcome to Pace IT's webinar. Tonight's topic is Common Security Measures, and it's taken from the CompTIA A Plus Exam 220-802 Objective 2.1. So what exactly is in that objective? Well, that's physical security. So that's implementing physical security to help secure your IT environment. And it also covers some digital security methods. So let's go ahead and begin with our topic, our first topic, which is physical security. So what's that mean? Well, that means that part of implementing a secure IT environment involves having the proper mindset. We'll start there. Your IT security begins at your front door, and it's up to you to operate in the most secure manner possible from the time that you start. Another thing to keep in mind is that your level of security is driven by the amount of security that is needed. And what, I, what do I mean by that is, well, if you're only dealing with a home network, yeah, it's really nice to secure your data, but you probably don't need to implement all of all of the physical security items that I'll be running through. Uh, your need for security just isn't that great. You have other issues that you'll need to deal with. But if you're working for a bank, guess what? You're going to need to implement the vast majority of these, if not all of them. So as the need for security increases, so should your level of security. Another thing to keep in mind is that security is a balancing act. Too much security, too many security measures, and your end users are going to rebel. They're going to start working out ways to get around your security measures. Why? Well, because security tends to be a little bit of a pain in the tuckus. But if you have too little security, well, and then you make your systems easy to break into and you're vulnerable. The key is to find the balance to where you have the appropriate amount of security for the situation that you're in. Okay. So back to talking about the mindset. Like I said, IT security begins at the door. It's up to you to operate in the most secure manner possible. Um, boy, I'm just reading re re that slide. I'm doing good. So here we go. At the minimum, lock your doors. Um, equipment should be in its own room. Your servers, your switches, your routers, they need to be in their own room. And that equipment room should be locked at all times. Not only should your equipment be in a locked room, but your networking equipment should be in locked cabinets inside that locked room. You need to re restrict access to only those who need it, one of the things that you learn when you start really d diving deep into security is that if the bad guy can get access to your equipment, well, it's really not your equipment anymore. It now becomes their equipment because if they can physically access it, they can change things on it. Uh, your locks can be electronic. As a matter of fact, I recommend that. Uh, use either RF. RFID badges or uh, mag magnetic blocks with key codes or magnetic strips. This way you can log who has been coming into and out of an area. Uh, it's kind of a nifty thing to have in case something goes wrong. And if you have, and if you are working in a high security environment, one of the things that you need to do is you need to implement um, anti-tailgating measures. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you have your equipment in a locked room and 
somebody punches in the, the door code and they open up the door and they go through, a bad guy a lot of the times will try and slide right in behind them before the door shuts. So one of the ways that they prevent that in really secure facilities is they actually make you go through a turnstile one at a time. Uh, most of us won't have to deal with it, but that's something to keep in mind. So another thing about physical security, require badges. Um, know who is who. And part of that is knowing who has the correct authorization at a glance. I already mentioned that badges can have an, a magnetic strip on them that you can use to unlock doors or to access systems. Some badges nowadays have RFID chips in them, radio frequency identifiers. Those two can be used to unlock doors or access systems. Another phys physical security measure that you can put into place are privacy filters. That prevents shoulder surfing. That's kind of a tongue twister for me. And what that is, is that somebody looking over your shoulder watching what you type in. A lot of people lose their passwords to somebody looking over their shoulder. And what a privacy filter does is it reduces the ability of somebody to view the contents of your screen without being noticed. Also, you need to make sure that people are not watching you type in your password. A lot of people have really good memories, and if they watch your keystrokes, they can probably duplicate them. Okay, so let's move on. So let's go to biometrics. You could implement biometric. Uh, that's making people prove who they say they are. Uh, fingerprints are a form of biometric, uh, retinal patterns, voice patterns, and facial recognition can all be used to authenticate the user. One of the things that I will tell you about biometrics is there are actually methods out there that will, can and will spoof uh, fingerprints, facial recognition, and voice patterns. So while they're a bonus, they're a little bit harder, they are defeatable. Uh, so don't just use biometrics on their own if you're in a secure environment. Um, I would recommend them with another form of uh, authentication, make it multi-factor. Another type of uh, biometric authentication that's coming along is actually your typing style. They have discovered that everybody has their own unique typing style and it's actually harder to spoof a typing style than it is a fingerprint. They're not completely along with this one yet, but they're working on it, so don't be surprised if that comes up sometime in the future. Another thing that you can use are tokens or key fobs. Uh, these can be used for both on-site and off-site access. These fobs use a logarithm to provide a rolling code. The code changes frequently. Uh, it's often set to one minute. Sometimes they're set to 30 seconds. Sometimes they're set to five minutes. The network administrator gets to determine how often the code changes. So when you're logging in, so you type in, uh, and you get a dialog box that pops up and asks for the code on your token. So you type in the, the code and the token, you type in your username and password, and voila, you're authenticated. And that's because the authentication server always knows, always knows, what the code is supposed to be at any given time. By the way, your end users can defeat security tokens, and I may talk about that one a little bit later. Okay, so now let's move on to your actual physical documents. So your key IT information needs to be documented 
just in case of an emergency. You never know when you might get hit by a bus. If you get hit by a bus, people have to have access to that information. But that documentation needs to be secured, at the minimum in a locked file cabinet with limited access, and only those who need to know should have access. Once that documentation becomes outdated, well, then you need to shred it. And when you shred it, don't use just a spaghetti shredder, use a crosscut shredder. People have run their documentation to a standard shredder, thought they were good, only to find out that some uh, not so nice people had more time on their hands than you would think, and they taped back those, those documents back together, and sensitive information was lost. So use a crosscut shredder. It's a whole lot more effective in destroying your data. So that's it for physical security. Now let's talk about some digital security. So how to help secure your environment digitally. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the principle of least privilege. And what that means is that you as the IT administrator or the network administrator or systems administrator, depending upon your title, you get to decide how much or how many privileges or what privileges each user has. And you really need to look at what their job entails and only give them the minimum rights and permissions that are needed to get the job done. Why is that? Well, if their user account or group gets breached, it's better if they have fewer privileges than more privileges. The use of least privilege is an effective security measure. So unless a top-level administrative group is compromised, it is easier to contain the breach. One of the things when you go to implement least privilege though, is your groups or end users are going to complain because they will have been able to do things in the past that they're no longer able to do now. Do not give in to them. Um, bad idea to give in. Keep their rights and permissions to a minimum. And by the way, you as the system administrator or network administrator, you need to have two accounts. You need to have your top level account for managing the system, and then you need to have your own account for day-to-day -day activities where you implement least privilege on yourself. That is the best way to secure that portion of your network. Another thing that you need to work on is end user education. Help the users understand security risks. A lot of them don't know, and it's up to you to educate them. So you need to train your users on the principle of least privilege, how to create strong passwords, what malware is, keep the importance of keeping system and security up to date, you need to teach them about social engineering and other attack vectors. Now, a lot of your training should be formal and documented, which means you train the end users and then you have them sign a document that says that they received the training. Some of your training can be informal. So when you go to Joe's, Joe's workstation because he's having a problem, you know, just talk with them. Give them some informal training right then and there. You don't need to document it, but it doesn't doesn't hurt, and it's often it's often the case that that informal training is the training that they actually remember best. So now let's move on to antivirus and malware software. It should be installed on every system. If it's not there, it can't stop an attack. It should be kept current on every system. If it's not current, it won't recognize an attack. 
and it should be active on every system. If it's not active, it can't stop an attack. And then we have anti-spyware software. Now, spyware is malicious code that collects information about the system, and it may or may not make changes to some settings. Anti-spyware anti can prevent that code from running, and it actually can help you the user to determine if the spyware is present in the level of threat that it, in, it represents. Now let's move on to firewalls. All networks should have firewalls on the perimeter, at the router, so they're out there on the edge preventing attacks. That everything within the walls of the firewall, all the workstations, should have firewalls installed as well. Firewalls are the traffic cops of the IT environment. They control the flow of data into and out of networks and systems. They do a very good job of preventing malicious code from running. Firewalls are highly important and everyone in every system should have a firewall implemented. User authentication should be implemented. There's three basic categories of authentication. There's what you know, that's username and password. What you have, security token or key fob are an example. And then there's what you are, biometric authentication. So everybody should have to authenticate to get onto your network. And the most effective means of authentication is actually multi-factor authentication. Use more than one of the categories above. Um, a lot of people think, by the way, that if you use, make them sign in with two usernames and passwords, that that's multi-factor authentication. Nope, that's single-factor authentication. That's only what you know. You need to mix the categories, okay? So uh, what you know and what you have are pretty good. Uh, what you know and who you, or what you are are good. You also need to implement a strong password policy. Um, require a strong mix of pass <laughs> a strong password. Require a minimum length, uh, mix of letters, numbers, and symbols, and make it so that passwords expire, and also make it so that uh, you can't use the same password for like 10 times in a row. You know, you got to, if you're, your end users can get around that, but you got to make them, they have to work at it, and pretty soon they'll quit working at it. Just, just don't make it too easy for them uh, to keep using the same password. So ideas for generating a strong password. Well, password strength is determined by the length of the password, and it is factored by the number of possible letters, symbols, and numbers that are allowed. So just allowing for an eight-digit length password that can only have letters and numbers means that there are eight to the 36th power possible combinations that a hacker needs to try. That seems like that's a fair amount. Guess what? It's not really that uh, difficult especially with some programs that are out there. What is more difficult is if you require a minimum of eight digits and you have to have a mix of letters, both lower and uppercase numbers, and you have to have special characters. What that really does is that then makes the minimum password strength eight to, I do believe, the 86th power in, in complexity. That's a whole lot tougher for that person to, or that hacker to crack. So now let's talk about uh, strong password a little bit more. Something that you can do is you can think of a phrase. Think of a phrase like, IT security is awesome. 
Now remove all the spaces and you have IT security is awesome. So then you can replace some capital and lowercase letters with the opposite. And then replace some letters and numbers with the symbols. And if you look at that down there at the bottom, that is a fairly strong password. Um, and then I put down right here, as you can see, that some password systems are now allowing for spaces. And that really increases the complexity of passwords. Uh, the phrase method that I just mentioned, or I, I just demonstrated there, is actually highly effective. And people actually remember phrases a whole lot better than they remember random letters and numbers. So if you're going to let your users generate their own passwords, I would recommend that you teach them the phrase method. So your security stance is actually going to be a combination of your physical security and your digital security. And your physical security begins at the front door. And it's all about preventing physical access to your systems. Your digital security is about protecting the network and systems from being compromised. The two work hand in hand. And it's going to be up to you as a systems administrator or a network administrator to ensure that your systems are secure. And that concludes tonight's webinar for the most part. Um, so how secure is your IT system? Well, it all begins with you. You might want to take a look at that hyperlink right there. That's a really uh, interesting article. There was a gentleman, a programmer for Verizon. He was doing a really good job for them. Um, always got top performance marks. Uh, was doing just an awesome job. Well, Verizon was doing a security audit. And they noticed that this strange IP address kept logging into their system. Uh, they, they tracked that IP address to China. And then they started to track what that IP address was doing. And that IP address was submitting programming code. Well, then they checked whose code it was. And it was this top programmer's code. He had actually outsourced his own job to China. Um, so they actually started looking at what he was doing. And he was actually spending quite a bit of his day uh, shopping on eBay, uh, doing things on Facebook, uh, watching cat videos on the internet. He was doing everything but working. Now, Verizon was paying him uh, apparently a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year because he was a top programmer. And he had, sub he had outsourced his job to China, and he was paying this consultant in China $50,000 a year just to code for him. Now, Verizon required that when you logged into their network, you had to have a security token code. The way this programmer defeated that, well, he FedExed his security token to his consultant in China. So not only did he give the security consultant his username and password, but also his security token. Uh, they're not quite sure how long that was going on. The one another thing that they found out is Verizon wasn't the only one he was working for. So he was doing that to other people. So just remember that. Uh, keep an eye on your security logs as well, by the way. Thank you for watching this webinar. I'm sure I'll do another one soon, and I look forward to your attendance.